Hey everybody, this is Arnold Schmidt. I'm a professor of English at California State University Stanislaus, and I'm welcoming you to the State Theater's Modesto Noir series. Uh, and this episode is on The Hitchhiker, uh, several versions of The Hitchhiker, one by um, Ida Lupino, uh, one uh, by Orson Welles, and uh, the uh, Orson Welles version is presented by the Gal Repertory Theater and the Sankofa Theater. Um, so we've got lots going on and um, we're very excited just to have you here. Um, and I'm delighted to be here with Arnold to present uh, not one, not two, but three versions of Hitchhiking. We're also joined by, uh, when we have our discussion uh, next Thursday, um, on the 20th, we'll be joined by Jim Johnson, uh, who has uh, directed the uh, episode for the Gallo Repertory Theater, as well as uh, Wes Page, who uh, was the cinematographer on it, did all the fancy editing and all this really cool special effects. So uh, we've got uh, a lot to talk about today. And when we have our discussion, a lot to talk about as well, because Jim and Wes will be joining us, as well as some cast members to talk about both the show, but also some of the technology that went into putting it together. And you'll see if, when you look at, the, at their uh, video, how kind of amazing all of this was. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Ida Lupino's The Hitchhiker, a bit about her background. And I should begin by pointing out that she is credited, she and her hus then husband, with the script for this film. Uh, and the actually the person who originated the story is not credited in the film. And that's a gentleman by the name of Daniel Menwaring. Uh, who was not listed because he had been blacklisted listed as a uh, alleged member of the Communist Party. And Howard Hughes, the head of RKO, which, which distributed this film, uh, didn't like people who were, quote, non-patriotic. <laughs> Ida Lupino was termed the English Jean Harlow. Uh, had enormous number of television and film credits, as well as directing credits. The only woman to direct herself in a major film. The first U.S. woman to, to direct a noir. There were some others in Europe who'd done the same, but she was the first U.S. woman to do so. She actually was the first woman to direct and star in an episode of The Twilight Zone. And uh, there are dozens of her credits uh, during the 40s and 50s and 60s and even into the 70s as a director and sometimes uh, actress in films and television series. Yeah, what, one of the things that she's famous for is real life or um, kind of present day uh, stories. She has a story about a sexual assault. She has a story about bigamy. Um, and um, so she's, she's really interested in uh, in social issue films, and and some of them are very, uh, uh, very, um, very controversial, uh, but really interesting to watch. Sometimes termed uh, a woman's director, a director of films that appeal to uh, females, which is kind of ironic when you look at this particular film, which opens, by the way, with this uh, role that uh, alleges that this is a true story of a man and a gun in the car. This is all attributed, by the way, to RKO's uh, publicists and a warning that the young couple across the aisle uh, could have been involved in this very situation. So a 70 minute film, the facts are actual. Well, not entirely. It is a based on uh, the story of Billy Cockeyed Crook, who said he was going to live by the gun in Rome, he was uh, the kidnapper of at least six people in a rampage across the Southwest and in Mexico in the early 1950s. And Lupino visited him on San Quentin's death row and obtained a release to make the film about him. Now, you'll notice it, his, if you'll go back one, um, uh, one slide, Arnold, you'll, you'll notice his 
his hand is being displayed here, the back of his hand and across the back of his hand was an inscription that said, hard luck. Kind of reminds you of the Robert Mitchum uh, love and hate um, from the 1950s uh, film. So if we go to the next film, we see an admonition from the Hayes office, which says no picture shall be dealing with the life of a notorious criminal of current or recent time, which uses the name, nickname or alias of such. Well, this is a barrier for filmmakers like Lupino, what's she going to do? So if you go to the next slide, you will see that she said, I wanted realism to appease the censor at the Hayes office. I reduced the number of deaths to three. So like, like many directors from the era who were laboring under the Hayes code in the Breen office, they found ways to get around the rules that uh, were imposed upon them by the censors. Fascinating cast, William Tallman as Emmett Myers. You may recognize him from the Perry Mason, season, uh, uh, Perry Mason series where he played the district attorney who lost all but one case against uh, Perry Mason. And that was on a, a technicality as I uh, recall. Uh, Cook, the the person on whom the film was based was short and stocky and had a cleft palate and an eye that never closed. Tallman, on the other hand, was tall and lean and older and made up with an eye that never closed with a prosthetic device, which was very uncomfortable, but made the character. The other two characters in the film Major characters Frank Lovejoy as Gil Bowman and Edmund O'Brien as Roy Collins, whose uh, fishing trip is cut short by Mr. Tallman, Mr. Meyer, sitting in the back seat, partially obscured by the lighting. Uh, well, we could go to the next one. Oh, I should point out that. <laughs> At the outset of the film, uh, Emmett Myers asks the two gentlemen uh, what they did for a living. And he discovers that uh, Frank uh, is an engineer and that uh, Roy is uh, a mechanic. And he says to Frank, well, you're the smarter one. And you will note in the film how differently he treats the two men. And one of the questions that I raise at the end is, uh, is in fact, uh, Gil really smarter uh, in this case? But you will notice that uh, Myers does play on the weaknesses of, of uh, Roy throughout uh, the film. Yeah. So something to, to, to mention here is you see this image of the uh, car in the desert. Um, one of the, when we think about films noir, we tend to think about um, images of the underworld, which to some extent we have here with this criminal, uh, but we also generally, they take place in cities, they take place in night, they often take place in the rain. Uh, here we're out in the desert, uh, there are some night scenes and some of them are quite powerful, but a lot of it is in the daytime. And instead of in, in traditional film noir, stereotypical film noir, we have a femme fatale, a woman who, um, either does the guy wrong or leads him into trouble or leads him into crime. Um, here, instead, we have, um, we have the criminal, we have a man. Um, so Ida Lupino in the script and in this, um, in this story uh, overturns a lot of the conventions. At the same time, it has the atmosphere of noir, the uh, camera angles, the, the German expressionist cinematography that we would expect we see in some of the scenes, particularly the night scenes. Um, and I think in particular, uh, there's a sense of claustrophobia that we get in traditional noir, of idea that the world is closing in on people. And here, uh, I think she gets that um, where she shows these really giant, beautiful, uh, broad landscapes uh, of the of the desert and very you know expansive scenes, but then comes in really close on the uh, on the car. 
Uh, so it's very, very interesting in terms of, you know, if you're thinking about some of the other noirs that we've talked about in this series, this one is very, very different. And I have actually driven on this road, which, uh -huh. <laughs> which, yeah, which is located, I, I didn't see the 1949 Plymouth, by the way. Uh, it is located in the Alabama Hills, which is near Independence, California, a home of the High Desert Film Museum, for those of you who are interested in a uh, an excursion. Uh, every year they have a Western film festival and you go out and walk among these rock, rocks or drive among these rocks and see locations where something like 500 films have been uh, made over uh, a number of years. Uh, Gunga Din, every Hopalong Cassidy movie, and these, these rocks that resemble Sharpe uh, dogs uh, it is really quite a trip. And I'd never seen this film until I saw it there in the local high school auditorium. And it was one of the most creepy experiences that uh, I've ever experienced. And I, and I think about it every time I see this film or I see films with this location in the background, I, I know it was done in the Alabama Hills. So I recommend that you uh, go tour. They have a an October film festival that focuses on Western films every year. You can go out and see whether where Gunga Dins uh, was filmed and the elephant walks across the, the, the bridge. Uh, and you can also take a side trip to Manzanar, the quote relocation unquote camp, uh, which has been artfully restored by the National Park Service. It's really a wonderful monument to uh, uh, an incident in American history that never should have happened, but uh, well worth your your time. Um, <laughs> it's it's really an amazing setting. It's off of, again off of Highway 395. the The cinematographer in this film was Nicholas uh, Mascura, Masaroka, uh, and uh, as Arnold noted, uh, the landscaping is a major part of this film. Uh, not to be missed. So I put together some picking up or on the hitchhiker over time. The, the, Bris the Bureau of Prisons um, criticized the film for being an underhanded trick of obtaining a release from, from Cook in order to make this story. Uh, film critics generally liked it, uh, not so much its conclusion, which we can talk about in the discussion on the 20th, the hobo news, which I didn't know existed, and hitchhikers generally uh, did not like the film. They thought it was a threat to highway nomads. I was thinking about that today in the context of the film, the Oscar rated film, Nomads. Uh, Lupino was not terribly excited, at least at the outset, about restoring the hitchhiker uh, because it might become some cult film which is not so bad. Uh, and finally, it's one of the few no noirs on the National Film Registry's list as being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. So uh, well worth your time, I think. So as you're watching the film, which you can watch for absolutely nothing on the Library of Congress's site, and we'll list that uh, presently, uh, there are some questions that you might think about. Uh, does it fit the category of film noir? And Arnold has commented on that. Uh, is there a feminist subtext to the film? Some people have said this is Lupino noir. Is there a Lupino noir uh, or not? Or does she direct like a man? Uh, whatever that means. Uh, what's the portrayal of Mexicans in this film? film partially, takes place partially in Mexico. Uh, some criticisms of the conclusion of the film on the grounds that there's kind of a letdown there. Uh, how does the cinematography uh, contribute to uh, the narrative? And could there be a radio adaptation of this particular film? Questions that you might want to ponder as you're watching the film and listening to the radio broadcast.
Good. And I, and just to jump back to that notion of the feminist uh, subtext, there's a lot of really interesting criticism, uh, you know, kind of scholarly criticism about this, because it's on the one hand, it's a buddy movie and buddy movies are always kind of homosocial, you know, male bonding or female bonding in the case of a female buddy movie, a buddy movie. Um, but so there's there's that kind of an element that's going on here. But the other thing is that in, in there are many instances in, and film scholars have talked about this of the men cooking and doing domestic tasks. In other words, they're taking care of each other. They're they're doing things that are um, in, you know, certainly stereotypically and certainly in, you know, 1950s America are seen as feminized activities. And so there's a way that um, masculinity is very much um, investigated here. Um, uh, you know, the, the issue that uh, that Randy raised earlier about who is smarter. Um, you know, what do we mean by smart? Do we mean intelligence? Do we mean caginess? Do we mean psychological strength? I mean, there's there's so much, uh, there's so many kind of aspects of this that, and she really does kind of play with this. So um, in, in that sense, it, it, the, the, the issue of gender is very, very interesting. And I would say, I think, I think if you're thinking about you know, people who talk about masculinity studies. There's there's a lot of very interesting stuff uh, to to think about here. These are three men in in very different situations. A very interesting power dynamic. Uh, very interesting relationships. The the intersubjectivity uh, between and among them. Uh, so that's that's another another way to to kind of think about this. So the uh, Gala Repertory Company and the Sankofa Theater Company uh, have done the radio play. And it's important to kind of understand that these are two uh, these these are two um, narratives that have the same um, the same title, uh, the Hitchhiker, but they actually tell two completely different stories. Um, so this is uh, presented by the Sankofa Theater Company, which is uh, in uh, Modesto's African American Theater Company. They've done a lot of really fantastic um, uh, stuff, and um, they do it through the Gallo uh, as Center and, and elsewhere. Um, and the, the screenplay for the, uh, the, the, the radio play that they're doing is, ba is written by, uh, by Louise uh, Fletcher. And she, um, she was connected, um, uh, she was married to Bernard Herman, um, who did uh, a lot of the um, uh, sound uh, soundtracks for um, uh, Alfred Hitchcock movies, um, but he's connected with the uh, Mercury Theater. And so she was able to, she got it to Orson Welles. Uh, he wanted her to, you know, she had this idea. And, um, and so they, they do this. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, his, his radio group does this. Welles himself does this uh, play four different times on radio. There's a series of, of, of times. He, it was very, very popular and he liked it a lot. Um, the production that that uh, you will see, uh, you know, this week when you go to the the websites that are at the end of this uh, presentation uh, by the Gallo Center Rep Repertory Theater, um, directed by Jim Johnson, and as I said, the the cinematography and editing and stuff by Wes Page, um, that is based on this um, is 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 you know based on this uh, this script. Uh, Lucille Fletcher uh, is a, a New York writer. Um, she went to Vassar. Um, she starts working at uh, CBS uh, and then uh, works her way up. Um, she writes a number of successful uh, radio plays and other plays. Um, she writes uh, Starry Wrong Number, which um, is another, uh, another story that we're going to be, uh, be talking about. And The Hitchhiker. And The Hitchhiker then, in addition to being a radio play that Orson Welles does four different times, becomes an episode in the first season of, of The Twilight Zone. Um, and so uh, there's a, uh, there is a, and if you go online, you can easily find the Orson Welles version. So you can hear the radio play, you can find the radio script, it's, it's available. And um, you can also find the Twilight Zone version, uh, which is interesting because it switches the characters a little bit. Orson Welles, as we, as you know, most of us know, um, is famous for, uh, famous for Citizen Kane, which for many years was considered the finest film. It, it won, uh, film critics considered it the, the greatest film ever made. Um, that was kind of knocked out of the box controversially by Hitchcock's uh, Vertigo a few years back. Um, but in any event, um, he's known for Citizen Kane, which has, although it's not a film noir, it has very noiry elements, um, and particularly the uh, camera angles, the lighting, the chiaroscuro lighting, which is very, very high contrast. But he's also known uh, uh, for 
having done the War of the Worlds radio broadcast through the Mercury Theater. This was a, th- a, a, um, a broadcast of of um, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds that, um, you know, people mistakenly thought was a real invasion. And it became really, um, as you can see from the top left, it made newspapers, uh, you know, headlines of, of people thinking that this was, uh, that this was a real invasion. But um, he's also, um, Wells is also famous for a couple of really good noirs, really dark um, Touch of Evil, which in some ways I think is like the, the darkest noir that I think I've ever seen. The character is just terrible. He's just this awful guy. Um, and he, he's, you know, Wells just really makes this happen. And as it has Charlton Heston playing a Mexican. So he's, you know, he's, he's kind of in yellow face. It's a, a strange, you know, racially, it's a strange role. Um, but the film is well worth seeing. Um, it's very, very powerful. Um, there has, has, has a lot of really great scenes. Um, the other thing uh, that uh, Wells is famous for is a film called Lady from Shanghai, which is, is different. Um, Wells uh, affects a really terrible Irish accent through the whole thing. And that's really the only thing I can say about, a bad thing I can say about a movie that is otherwise just fantastic. Um, it's, it's really got amazing uh, relationship stuff and friendship and crime and love and all the, or uh, the, uh, you know, something that seems like love. But, but the, what it's famous for among all of that, those things is an ending sequence that's a shootout in, a, uh, in this mirrored hall um, that if you, you know, just go on Google and Google um, Lady from Shanghai mirror shots and you'll see this five minute sequence and it's really, really amazing. Very much worth your time. So this is, this is where Wells is, is coming from when they first did The Hitchhiker in uh, 1941. Uh, Rod Serling then um, does a version of this, as I said, in 1960 and switches the driver from, uh, from a man uh, to a woman. Um, Randy, did you have, want to talk about either of these two? Uh, no, I think you've covered uh, uh, the first version. The, the second one, I think, is, is fascinating because of the gender uh, reversal and the, uh, the passenger, the difference in the passenger scenes between the uh, radio version and Rod Serling's version so yeah and they're both they're definitely worth catching um and actually if you want to kind of make a a trifecta of it you can find them both online and then you can watch the uh sankofa theater uh production which um the the theater group has done a series of um of uh really strong plays uh the piano lesson freedom riders fences uh wilson's fences the uh raisin in the sun and uh, and uh wilson's seven guitars um so the cast um, it comes from the Sankofa Theater, and this just gives you an idea of what Wes uh, Page will talk much more about on uh, when we when we have our discussion. But this was done with green screen. There's a real, or the car is real, the actors are real, um, but a lot of the backgrounds are are not real, um, or they're doctored. In other words, you'll see, and he explains this in in. In the in the play itself, in the beginning of it, there's a little preface where uh, where Jim and, and Wes explain what's going on. But they're actually um, taking contemporary images of like a store and then taking out the contemporary ads and putting in 1930s ads or 1950s ads. So it's very very interesting. The technology here is really interesting. The cast is fantastic. They're really good. Um, Willie Williams is is just really good um, and. Um, uh, Cheryl Knox uh, as his mom, uh, Elizabeth Garman, who answers the phone when he calls. Um, the gas station attendant, Michael Baldwin, is really good. Mark Housey as a storekeeper, he wakes up in the middle of the night. Uh, another hitchhiker, uh, Abby Nunes, who's really good and kind of vulnerable, but also smart and savvy. And boy, John Irvin is just fantastic as the as the hitchhiker. He's just so creepy. He's really, really good. So this is is just a fantastic. I mean, it's 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 really good on so many levels. The performances are good. The script is good. Uh, the production is something that you're generally not going to see. Um, uh, you know, it's it's really kind of. I, I think that Jim and and Wes really took uh, the 
the limitations that COVID has placed on them as filmmakers and as, 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 as theater artists, and instead of seeing those as a negative, turn them into a positive and really face those challenges well. It's a, it's a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, a piece, of, um, a piece of film and piece of theater. Um, so what you want to do is to register for um, this discussion, and you can do that with this website here. Um, and what you'll get is a, uh, an email, uh, and then you just click on it and you'll register. And then uh, next Thursday, um, the, uh, the 20th at, uh, uh, in that afternoon, we start at seven o'clock, but that afternoon you'll get a link and then you'll go in and uh, Jim will be there, Wes will be there, I will be there, Randy will be there, and several members of the cast will be there as well. In order to see these films before, you, before the discussion, uh, Ida Lupino's film is at the Library of Congress. They have a really fantastic uh, version of it. It's, um, it's, it's pretty clean. It looks really good. It's absolutely free. Um, so you can watch that. And then the, um, the uh, Orson Welles version, which is the one that, um, that the uh, Gallo Center is doing, is available here on Vimeo. Again, that is also free. So all of these are free. Um, and as I said, if you want to keep going, there's the, um, you can find another, you know, the Orson Welles original version, and you can find the Twilight Zone original version too. So we invite you to uh, participate in our Mod first annual Modesto Noir Festival uh, with the Hitchhiker, four different versions of the Hitchhiker, uh, and then join us next month for Sorry, Wrong Number, a film that appeared in 1949, uh, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Burt Lancaster. I'd totally forgotten that he was playing the husband in the film. Uh, originated as a radio drama, uh, expanded into a, a film, uh, quite a good noir film, uh, quite different from what you're likely to uh, experience, and uh, also being presented by in, in cooperation with the Prospect Radio Theater Radio Cavalcade players. So you will be able to access their version and also there are online versions available. So we do urge you to sign up for that. Again, that's free. There is a small charge for the PTP Radio Cavalcade presentation and you can obtain information at the PTP website. Uh, and then the next two months in July and August, we are partnering again with the Gallo Center uh, to present Arsenic and Old Lace, uh, their presentation, our presentation, and finally, one of our all-time favorite noirs, Maltese Falcon. Uh, again, we'll present the film, talk about the film, and you will also have the opportunity to see the uh, Gallo Center's uh, uh, production of the Maltese Falcon. Yeah, and, and remember that um, all of the videos of the, uh, the discussion, the lecture that Randy and I put together before the films, before the screenings and the discussions that we um, hope you come and join us for after are absolutely free. You can get those from the, uh, the State Theater and the, um, the Gallo Center's videos are all free. And um, the films, this, the um, Hitchhiker, the Lupino Hitchhiker is, uh, is a, a real opportunity for us because it's, it is free on the Library of Congress. But some of the other movies, uh, Sorry, Wrong Number, Are Sneaking Old Lace and Maltese Falcon, you'll have to track down either through um, a Netflix or on a, a, a Turner, um, but they're very easy to find uh, and they're, they're all really great films. So um, we hope you're enjoying the uh, Modesto Noir series. We're hoping to um, continue it um, when COVID uh, lets things open up a little bit uh, at, the, uh, at the theater on the big screen. And um, we hope you'll join us. Feel free to email us uh, your favorite noirs uh, and uh, let us know if there's other things that we should be thinking about. So Arnold Schmidt signing off for Modesto Noir. Thank you for joining us. I hope you, uh, hope you had a good time. And Randy? And see you at our discussion uh, on the 20th. Your questions and comments are certainly invited. Thank you.